the Yakuza games have no shortage of great villains. Across the eight mainline entries of this series, you'll find all manner of ne'er-do-wells, from corrupt politicians to power-hungry patriarchs to men dressed as babies. But there's one particular game in this series that packs an almost absurd amount of memorably menacing men into its narrative, and that is 2015's absolute classic, Yakuza 0. There are so many fantastic baddies burned onto this disc. I could talk for hours about Kuze and his dope-ass subway motorcycle sequence. I don't know how the fuck he got that down there, but whatever. I could talk about Wano and his lady shooting dance parties, Shimano and his big bald head, or Shibusawa and his bare naked cock. Oh, holy fuck, this is raw! But I'm not gonna do any of that, as I am instead going to talk about the best villain in Yakuza 0, possibly one of the best characters in Yakuza, period. And that is one, Tsukasa Sagawa. This guy is a piece of shit. So first and foremost, let me just lay out the basic premise of Yakuza Zero's story and Sagawa's place within it real quick. It'll serve as a setup for new people to the franchise as well as a refresher for older fans. <clears throat> the year is 1988 and Japan's economy is booming. A short-lived real estate bubble has resulted in an age of prosperity for the country, which basically means shit is crazy, people are throwing around cash like it's nothing, and going ham on the motherfucking dance floor in the meantime. Our story follows two playable characters in two separate cities who become embroiled in the same conflict involving multiple Yakuza families fighting over ownership of a small but vitally important plot of land. The two protagonists that I just mentioned are 20-year-old Kazuma Kiryu and 24-year-old Goro Majima, who, by the way, are two of the greatest characters in video game history. Now, our secondary protagonist, Goro Majima, is effectively serving hard time in this game, Yakuza style. Some heavy ass shit went down between Majima and his family a couple years back that resulted in the man being tortured for a year straight and exiled from said family. But he still wants back in for reasons that would take too long to explain. Uh, plus they'll kill him if he runs away. They're watching his every move, every second of every day. The reason Majima is being monitored so closely is because he's been tasked with managing a club known as The Grand. He's effectively attempting to serve his time and pay his dues by working this shitty ass real job. Buying his way back into the Yakuza business. And this district manager acting motherfucker Tsukasa Sagawa is a looking over his shoulder the whole time. Sagawa serves as Majima's handler throughout Yakuza 0. He's effectively his very fucked up boss. And that puts our protagonist in the very unique predicament of not being able to fight back against the way he's being treated. Like, if Majima loses it on Sagawa, he's gonna catch a bullet. Or many bullets, more likely. Personally, I fucking love this element of Sagawa as a Yakuza character. The fact that you never actually get to fight this dude really makes him stand out in this of all franchises. It's a simple choice that goes a long way to making him intrinsically more hateable than a majority of the series' villains, simply because you never get the catharsis of pulling the heat action on the motherfucker and slamming his butthole into a metal railing. Nearly every named male character you meet in these games, you will throw hands with at some point, but Sagawa skates away clean, not a scratch on his ass until that very well-deserved bullet to the brain at the end there, which was so immensely satisfying that I can hardly put it into words. I feel like the lack of a boss fight with this character is one of the reasons people tend to dismiss him or not rank him highly on their tier lists, but again, I think it's a great and very deliberate choice. On top of making him extra easy to despise, it also frames him as less of a fighter and more of a... I don't know, a weasel? Never posting up to this guy helps mechanically emphasize just how small he is. He's petty and tiny, and you just want to kick his fucking teeth in, but no. Your only option is to sit there and watch Majima get abused by this man, time after time. And the main reason that watching this abusive relationship play out is so affecting is because the character of Sagawa is brought to life by a knockout performance by actor Shingo Sarumi. しょうがねえな。他ならの支配人さんのお願いだ。さて、ちょっくら言ってくるよ。
Holy fuck, dude. This is one of the best performances that this medium has ever been blessed with. Put this character up there with the ranks of Sinua and Joel Miller because Surumi cranks out prestige drama level material for hours on end. It's fucking electrifying every time the man is on screen. Games often struggle to fully capture the intricacies of an actor's performance, but not here. There's so much character packed into the littlest idiosyncrasies this guy displays. Every head roll and sideways glance is packed with this flippant, abhorrent smugness that is both unbearable to watch and infinitely watchable. He's annoying, he's wormish, he is absolutely a no-good, loathsome prick. But as you spend more time with him, you also realize that he's backed up with this subtle integrity and tenacity that helps you understand how he ended up attaining the high-ranking position that he holds. Undeniably, Sagawa has a lazy streak. He's constantly acting so put out over shit, and he does bark orders at Majima at every possible opportunity so he doesn't have to get off his ass and do anything, but when the moment legitimately calls for it, he does get off his ass and gets the job done, no matter how much he has to dirty his hands. And in the context of the Yakuza life he's leading, gotta say, sort of admirable. Many of the villains in this series are shown kicking back in their high chairs as they order waves on waves of disposable goons to charge after our main characters, but not Sagawa. Despite the fact that he's basically middle management in terms of the Yakuza, he is perfectly willing to hit the streets and get boots on the ground in the dirtiest parts of Sotenbori, because as a bottom feeder, that is where he thrives. This scene, right here, perfect example. Sagawa plants a motherfucking car bomb under Lee's van and blows him to Kingdom Come, instantly killing a person that I'm reasonably sure Majima would consider a friend at this point in the story, and then he slinks up to Majima and says this. What a fucking line that is. So understated, so mean. He has just killed Majima's only trusted companion, and he has the gall to say, You're the fucking worst, man. What a fucking prick! How can you not love this guy? That one line also hints at the borderline sociopathic nature of this character. He doesn't seem to genuinely feel much of anything, unless it's something that's gonna cost him his own skin. Maybe that's just me misinterpreting his cool head, but the portrait he paints of his childhood does involve him killing his parents' cat, so... Yeah, dude's nuts. But in a believable and compelling way, he's not on some one-note, over-exaggerated conda shit. Now I've been showing snippets from a lot of different scenes over the past few minutes, and that dovetails into another noteworthy element of Sagawa, and that's just how much screen time he gets. This dude's got at least 10 major scenes in this game. He's basically the second lead of Majima's entire half of the story. Rarely does a Yakuza villain get this much time to develop and breathe. Fucking Ryuji doesn't get as much screen time as this guy. Nishiki, Mine, Shimano, Dojima, Sawashiro, there are so many great villains in this series, and so few of them get as much screen time as this fucking rat we're looking at right now. And that screen time is not wasted, not one bit, because we really get to know this guy. I, but also not really, because by the end of the game, he's still kind of a mystery. We get just enough info across the story to inform little bits of his character, his past, and his place in this world, but... Beyond that, again, the dude's a bit of an unknown. We never even get to see what his tattoos look like. Although there is some very good fan art out there that shows like some interesting designs. I really like the idea that his tattoos wrap all the way up his arms. That, that's random shit though. The point I was trying to make is that I was always left wanting more regarding Sagawa, in a good way. Speaking of wanting more, something I definitely wish we spent more time with was the relationship between Sagawa and his oath brother, Futoshi Shimano. That's some interesting shit right there. Sagawa and Shimano only share one scene over the course of Yakuza 0, but it suggests a very strange and strained brotherhood. I don't think these two like or respect each other very much at all. It seems to me that Shimano took this oath with this wormy fuck from a completely different gang, specifically so he would A, have a connect with the Omi Alliance, just in case he wanted to overthrow the Tojo clan one day, B, to link up with somebody without a spine to do his bidding, and C, so he would have someone to throw under the bus whenever that may be necessary. Which is exactly how Sagawa gets that final Jimmy Neutron ass brain blast. 
As for Sagawa's end of that Oath Brother deal, despite the reality of living as Shimano's underling, he does get to glom onto this big toe of a man and ride his coattails all the way up to the high ranks of the Tojo clan, living that patriarch high life until Shimano inevitably decides that he's outlived his usefulness. Which is a backstab that I think Sagawa knows is coming. I mean, just look at the way Sagawa acts when Shimano speaks to him here. That's pure fucking disdain right there. In contrast to the other Oath Brother relationships we've seen throughout the series, there's no shared love between these two. It's just business. But like, how did they meet? How and when did this little plan they're putting together get established? Were these two men ever actually friends? And how much does Sagawa know he's getting played here? Clearly a little bit because the motherfucker is crying outside of the climactic Omi deal. That is the face of a man who knows he's about to get fucked. This plan has spiraled so far out of control. She has gone sideways in 10 different ways and oh god, here comes Majima and he's got a gun. This is when Sagawa knew he was going to die. This whole relationship between Sagawa and Shimano is where I'm getting that middle management dig I threw out earlier, by the way. Despite the fact that Sagawa is a patriarch, it also appears that he reports directly to Shimano. He doesn't seem to have that much influence within the Omi on the whole. He's an unimportant man. But he's important to me. Alongside Shimano, the other main relationship Sagawa maintains throughout the story is with Majima, which we've already touched on a bit, but might as well discuss it a little further before we wrap things up, because it is a complex relationship for sure. Well, I mean, not so complex from where Majima stands. It's crystal clear that he views Sagawa purely as an antagonistic force in his life, an obstacle that constantly crops up to ruin his fucking day. Sagawa is hounding Majima throughout the entire 40-hour campaign, making his life hell by relentlessly hanging over the one-eyed demon and showing up when it is least convenient. This dude is everywhere, to the point where I think he's a primary influence on the Majima everywhere mechanic of Kawami 1. Crazy ass Cyclops had to pick up that stubbornness somewhere. He himself says just as much in the pair's final scene together. As for Sagawa's feelings on Majima, I think the former views the latter as more of a pet than a person. A funny subordinate to bully and fuck around with in his spare time. He does express remorse when he's about to kill Majima as if he cares about him, and I do think he's come to like Majima on a surface level because he has that privilege as the person in power between the two of them, but I don't think he actually cares that much. I think he looks at the situation like he's having to put down a rabid dog that, like, his neighbor left with him. One that he's become mildly attached to simply through appreciating its spunky attitude and stylish ponytail. This off-putting owner-slash-pet vibe going on between the two of them is put on blast every time Sagawa uses the nickname Tiger. It's... It's weird and demeaning. And he never stops doing it, either. It's not like he becomes a better person by the end of the story like so many Yakuza villains. He throws around that condescending nickname minutes before his fucking life ends. Although it does have a slightly more respectful connotation in that context. This concluding scene between Majima and Sagawa does show that a more genuine sense of camaraderie has built up between the two of them in the back half of the game, if for no other reason than they both witness the links that the other will go to in order to get shit done. But even then, the feelings of respect aren't exactly mutual. Sagawa basically says, Man, we went through some crazy shit together, didn't we, best buddy? And Majima's like, Yeah, I still fucking hate you, but it was a wild ride. Hey, we're basically colleagues now that you're back in the family, so, you know, drop me a line if you're ever in town. No, that's spine tingling. I never want to see you again. But I will say, you are fucking tenacious. Maybe I'll carry some of that tenacity forward with me when I meet the love of my life and spend days on days waiting in sewers to surprise him with random fight sex in the middle of the streets. And then our hero walks off into a brighter future, having recently been christened with the legendary title of the Mad Dog of Shimano, courtesy of none other then Tsukasa Sagawa. This is the character that gave the mad dog his moniker. That's fucking awesome! But then, all of a sudden, the other shoe drops. Huh. <sighs> Fantastic scene. Sagawa takes the heat for his Oath Brother's treasonous actions throughout Yakuza 0 and dies in a dirty alley, but not before showcasing that aforementioned tenacity and integrity in his last moments. He faces down death like a true fucking gangster and it just floored me the first time I saw it. 
brilliant end to a brilliant character. In conclusion... Saga is the best Yakuza villain, and nobody can convince me otherwise. He is a complex, layered, and entertaining character. He's unique in that you never fight him. He's brought to life by an awards-worthy performance. His relationships with other characters are gripping. He goes out like a total fucking badass, and I love how he doesn't fall into the series' predictable redeemed then dies trope. He just fucking dies. With Sagawa, there's no plot point that gives me pause, no wacky reveal that recontextualizes his entire storyline, no lack of appropriate screen time, none of that shit. He's just amazing through and through, purely entertaining to watch, think about, and discuss, and for that reason, for that consistency, Sagawa is the best Yakuza villain. To be fair though, I have only played five of these games, so there's still room for a new favorite to crop up from the remaining entries. But still, Sagawa's dope, and you better put some fucking respect on his name from now on.